We all have heard horror stories of how a remodel nearly tore a couple apart, as well as how impactful our environment can be on our state of well-being. Remodels don't have to end in divorce, and we can reflect our true selves in our environment with the right approach. Welcome to Psychotecture. My name is Rachel Melvald, and I'm a psychotherapist and designer. Psychotecture was developed as a methodological approach to ease issues that come up in design challenges, as well as the philosophy on how our environment can reflect our highest selves. Each week, I will interview an expert in the field of design and psychology to shed light on design challenges. I will also have a special series called The Psychotech is In, where I can offer help to those in design intervention need. If you're enjoying this Psychotech is in, please subscribe to my podcast, as well as follow me on social media at Rachel Malvald. And if you are a client, couple, or designer architect having a design challenge, please feel free to email me at my website, psychotecture.com, or rachel at psychotecture.com. Welcome to the Psychotech is in. Today, we are so honored. I was chasing this guest somebody I know from my past who's been a very influential architect in why I even came to be the psychotect because Peter Zellner, I had taken his class at Southern California Institute of Architecture Mm -hmm. and we share a common love and appreciation for psychology, architecture, and design. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our LA-based architect, Peter Martinez Zellner. So welcome. And just to give a little background, I had just gotten on your your new email list with what you're talking about with LA architecture. And I think just, we're going to give the audience all the information at the end, but let's just do a general introduction as to who you are as an architect here in Los Angeles. Welcome. Thank you, Rachel. Well, uh, as you said, I am uh, practicing. I'm actually a designer and an artist and a writer. That's what I I like to say these days, since I tend to move between, you know, designing environments for art and houses. I'm working on a house right now in West Los Angeles, which I'm also going to act as the builder on, which is that's a very interesting endeavor. I've never actually supervised construction directly, so I'll be very hands on. And then when I'm not uh, architecting, I'm teaching, as you know, and writing. And then over the course of the last um, four years, I've been exhibiting my paintings, which we can talk about a little bit later. But I think primarily, you know, you know me as a teacher. So that's something I've been doing pretty much uh, consistently since 1994. I started teaching in Australia, where I studied undergraduate architecture. And I haven't stopped this fall. I'm teaching in Brooklyn at the Pratt Institute. And last year I taught up at Berkeley as a visitor. And before the pandemic, I was the visiting chair at the University of Kentucky. So I've been bouncing around a bit uh, out of Los Angeles. Yeah. And bouncing around in the greatest institutions for art and architecture, you know, Pratt well, and to you. go to Berkeley. And and I didn't know just briefly that you studied in Australia. I studied at University of Western Australia in Perth. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that in Perth, huh? WA. Yeah. You know I, it. I didn't know that at all. Of course. I have a really good friend now who, Nathaniel Belcher, who is at, now the chair of architecture at Curtin University which is a rival school over in, in WA. Oh, really? Yeah, it was... Yeah, he just moved there right before the pandemic. Yeah, it was the hardest. I was doing their BFA program and their uh-huh. schools are like graduate programs. Their undergrad yeah. is like graduate school. So they threw me uh-huh. in that studio and it was like... Wow. Unbel- yeah. I lived there from 1988 to 1997. My father's family fled uh, Eastern Europe right after, well, kind of during the, the Second World War. And they landed in a refugee camp in Austria. And then they were in Austria, I think, until 51. And because they had landed in the British sector, like a lot of refugees, they had to choose between Australia and Canada. And oh. so they picked Australia. And so my dad took an Australian citizenship 
And when I was born, he registered me. So I'm actually uh, Australian American. Um, That's wonderful. And so, yeah, which is weird. But as a result, I, I was able to go study there. And I did that. I was going to go for a year. And then a year turned into five years. And then I got my first teaching job in Melbourne. And then I got my first commission there. And then I stayed until I came back here to go to grad school. And then you went to grad school in Los Angeles. And that's how you... Oh, no. No. No, I went to grad school in, in Boston. Oh, in Boston. Okay. That's yes. right. And I'll be not one of those people who says, oh, guess what school I went to? I went to Harvard. You went to Harvard. I, yes. Yeah. yeah, And that's why I came back to the States. I went to Harvard specifically because I, I wanted to get into the Harvard project on the city. And that's uh, that's why I went to Boston. And just to circle back, when I read your email blast for this newsletter that is so informative, uh-huh. is it called The Horizontal Fault, right? Fault. Yeah. Yeah. And as the psychotect, as we know, and the audience knows, Mm -hmm. what brought me into this idea of intervening in difficult, challenging architectural and remodel situations as a psychotherapist, but also really getting into the psychology of how our environment influences us and what are those variables you know, everything from the traumatic trauma union to the sensory as to how we interact with space. You've always been somebody that goes from the intrapsychic to looking at the political. Oh, okay. For me, I found that because, you know, I'm trained as a social worker. So we were, I really learned about human behavior as the person in the environment. And our intrapsychic issues can be defined by who deems what to be symptomatic, right? In our our social world. Sure, sure. So when I was taking a class with you, it was more on urban planning. So I think Uh your ability to, as an architect and an artist and a designer and a writer, your perspective I feel like jives with how I perceive people in space and the larger society and the issues that influence us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I saw your topic on chromophobia, (laughs) I said, oh my God, okay. You know, I know you're building and we're going to follow your projects in the future, but this is something as a psychotherapist who is trying to understand how design variables affect us. Chromophobia was new to me and I've interviewed color experts and I have not heard of this. Yeah. So I'm just going to open it up as our topic and how, you know, you as somebody that can speak to how you fell upon this issue of chromophobia and what it is and how you can relate this to the history of architecture and yourself as an artist finding color. I mean, Mm -hmm. these are a lot of questions, but let's just open Mm -hmm. up to chromophobia. What is it? And the book that you referenced. Well, I mean, Rachel, I think those are really excellent insights. And I, I mean, in a therapeutic sense, I have been using my Substack newsletter, the horizontal fall to work through, I mean, I guess in a public format, really issues that have dogged me professionally and creatively for like, like the last 15, 20 years. And, you know, I mean, some of it may have to do with the therapeutic work that I'm doing with my therapist, but a lot of that deals, I think more specifically with, you know, personal and and family histories, right? But I've been discovering that, you know, rather than having a diary, which I I find, you know, kind of an uninteresting use of my time as a writer, I guess, I thought, well, what if I just use my Substack as a as a way to work through, again, some of these creative issues that are tied to personal history as a way to connect the sort of the way you put it, I guess, to connect the personal with the political. Right. So my, my writing ranges you know, from writing through issues of city making to addressing, you know, homelessness in Los Angeles. But then I've also taken the opportunity to start to deconstruct in a way what I've been working on since about 2000. 
and using the Substack platform as a lens to start to examine some of my own biases and let's say, um, hang up, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> our shadow side. Right. And in a way what's behind me, which is a painting that I made in, in 2017 has been part of that process. And we can talk about that in relationship to my fear of color, because painting has been the primary vehicle for me to start to address some of my phobias as an architect, and some of those phobias translate into a fear of using color in my own work or proposing it, you know, in my projects, and also introducing pattern. And color and pattern, as you may know, are, are historically disciplinary matters that have been considered taboo for most of the 20th century. Ornament, too, right? Right. And that's what I think to hear the historical context, which I wasn't really connecting to as much that, oh my God, color is a, and we'll get to this more, but this phobia is entrenched in the historical patriarchal confines of our history, right? So we yeah, can't separate our culture, yeah. the super ego in Freudian terms of uh-huh. why we're, we've had these barriers to accessing color. Mm. Yeah, I, I would just say this, and I don't mean to jump in. I was just thinking about how we even use the term colorful. If you describe somebody as colorful, or if you describe something they said as off color, it implies that basically color is a pejorative, right? Mm-hmm. There's a bias in our culture towards a kind of desaturation, right. let's say, of how we dress, what color our buildings might take, and, you know, what our environments look like. And there is, a, at least in North America, there is a tendency to favor a kind of off-white to kind of, I would say, sort of Swiss coffee kind of shitty brown that we see. <laughs> That's Swiss coffee. Yeah. Thank right. you. Right. And it, and it, but it has a sort of, there's a blandness to it. And, and as I noted to you in an email, I mean, I'm discovering that a lot of this fear of color in our environment is in fact legislated. So a lot of communities have design guidelines that prevent people, for instance, uh, from painting their house lilac. You can get fined for that. That is so interesting how that, how it is entrenched in our societal chains of getting fined for using color. Right. And then I think on top of it, as David Batchelor points out in in Chromophobia, that in at least in, in Western societies, color is associated with femininity. Mm-hmm. It's associated with homosexuality. Mm-hmm. It's associated with theatricality. I mean, again, and these are not um, things that I think in a masculinist culture are enabled or empowered, right? Right. And it's nature and it's the wild. Wow. And that's it's- true too, isn't it? So that's the control of nature. And right. that goes back into our biblical, you that's know. super fascinating. I mean, you know, really the fear of, because, you know, what's interesting also, if you, if you look at the history of picturesque, for instance, in Western painting, the picturesque is an, an attempt, as I understand it, to constrain nature into something that can be bracketed. And that's different from something like wilderness, right? Which right. is alien and which is also, I think, subject to fear. So do you think just in, as an artist, you having, you being both an architect and an artist, and that's what's so appreciative for me, I appreciate that you are coming from both these perspectives. Someone like a Turner who painted to contend with this fear of the unruliness and the wild part of nature that we can't control. Because we look at the pictorial as trying to control and frame it, and you're Mm -hmm. saying it's a way that we're accessing this fear. Is that what you're saying or is... is Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know. I mean, again, I wouldn't know precisely, you know, I'm speaking as a cultural critic, perhaps. I would say that if you look at accounts of colonization, well, especially in Latin America, you know, the encounter that Europeans had with something like the Amazon, you know, inspires a certain kind of both desire for conquest, but also a fear of the native, 
right? Right. And the comfort that natives who were described as noble savages, right, Mm -hmm. have of being in nature and the fear that we have as being domesticated by our cities, let's say, and that's the condition that Europeans left, you know, in the 14th and 15th centuries, already, I think, sort of presupposes a kind of otherness to wilderness. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think when you look at it in the tradition of like romantic painting, I mean, Turner in particular was interested in the sublime as I understand it. Right. I don't know that much about sublime. I just pulled that out because it's so <laughs> but it's a good, no, wild but it's and good, it's but, but, but there is an attempt, I think, and I, I'm sure we could find enough reference uh, around this in historical painting, especially biblical paintings, to sequester and to domesticate nature and right and to place it you know, if you look at the history of Western painting, I mean, so much of it, nature is placed, Eden, for instance, is placed within, um, it, it's sequestered within a kind of domesticated, you know, landscape. So if you look at, you know, like a lot of Flemish and Dutch paintings that touched on biblical themes, the settings are, are basically European landscapes that had been domesticated by agriculture for centuries, right? Mm-hmm. So there is a kind of flattening of those backgrounds it isn't the kind of wild other, you know, that holds the serpent that speaks to the sort of sin of that encounter with wilderness, right? Right. And I think that's when we go to chromophobia uh-huh. and other phobias, the fear of snakes, it usually is native and of nature in its primitive form or primitive impulse that the fear gets projected upon that it's in our subconscious, right? There is that archetypal, you know, how we go and talk Jung, but there is that archetypal universal fear, right? Of Mm. these, like whether it's a snake, color, wilderness, you know, to repress that, to control that. And there's the phobia, right? We're, we're, it's of a repressive defense, Hmm. Well, yeah. And you know, what's interesting about what you're pointing out is that uh, Theodore Adorno, who, you know, lived in Los Angeles for a period of time, um, wrote about, I guess, the aesthetics of lethality, like lethal things in nature. And he notes that like venomous and toxic creatures tend to be really beautiful. Like yeah. if you look at a lot of tropical snakes, they're, they're, they're iridescent. Or if you look at the frogs in the Amazon that poison you fatally on contact, they're these luminous, beautiful, bright colors. Iridescent. He talks about really those colors, you know, coral snakes, for instance, which are hyper deadly, are these beautiful banded, like they look like jujubes. And so he discusses the lethal and basically Western kind of fear of the lethal around having to encounter these these creatures that you know don't normally appear in a, in a more domesticated landscape. So it's so interesting as we delve more into the fear of color, the lethality of these creatures that are the most yeah. venomous are the most colorful and attractive. Yeah. And we know that sometimes it's not always the feminine and the masculine of a peacock, peacocking. So kind of circling back to how this lives in our collective unconscious archetypally, as you as an artist architect, I'm interested Mm -hmm. in continuing with how, what I admire in you so much is you are an architect that really does evaluate your process and evaluates your psychology and so much that you've been what we call in psychological terms it's like there's this individuation personally Uh as you've claimed more of your roots again Mm. and you going back to your lineage because so much of psychotherapy i think is we can't separate from our roots. We can't divorce ourselves. And when we're, we're connected to that, that's when we're, we're going to individuate more. And, and to see how you evolve as an artist and an architect, and, and I, I want to reference some of your work, mm-hmm. at what juncture as an architect 
were you able to face the fear of color? Like, can we reference, mm. and now I'm going to reference mm. some of your work that okay. you provided. So to look at, I mean, let's say you just, you going into designing art gallery spaces, which are traditionally the white cube of what we're yeah. speaking to. Right. Just a little bit of background on my own work. To begin with, most of my work from about 2003 until 2013, sort of a 10-year period, involved designing art galleries in Los Angeles and New York and San Francisco. And, and I uh, recently, well, I actually recently did a, I designed a studio in, in Tijuana in Mexico for a friend who's a great painter, um, Enrique Chiapa. So exciting. But, you know, I would say this. I mean, there is a bias, as you pointed out, in the art world for essentially the architect's intervention to remain neutral so that artworks, like the installation by Katrina Fritsch uh, here at Matthew Marks Gallery that you see on the um, right, essentially are foregrounded, right? Mm -hmm. And so... In general, when I have proposed the use of alternate materials for color to my clients, the answer has been no thank you for, I think, a variety of reasons, um, mostly not to upset the artists, since I think a lot of artists take offense, let's say, when architects attempt to intervene in what an appropriate background should be for their art. But it's been normalized. But I would sort of note that prior to the, let's say, 20th century, art was publicly displayed, you know, often in private homes, but also in museums, in rooms that were not white. So if you go to the Metropolitan, for instance, and you look at certain collections, you'll see that, you know, historical paintings can be shown against colored walls. Yeah. Flocked walls. Mm -hmm. You know, some can even carry fabric. Mm -hmm. And it's a late 20th century sort of, let's say, 60s forward conceit that the gallery should be a white box. And I think what sort of happened to me as an architect is I got stuck in the conundrum of making white boxes. And the white box here in West Hollywood, the Matthew Marks Gallery, which was a collaboration with the artist Ellsworth Kelly, has a sculpture of his that happens to be black and it's on a white building. And it references a painting he made in black and white called Black Over White. And so in some ways, I mean, I think that, you know, partially I had to respond to the brief, which I think responsible architects do, which is I didn't propose a yellow building. But at the same time, I think I also sort of fell victim in a way to a certain tradition that I'm starting to discover maybe I don't agree with so much. So in the process of having to respond to a brief and obviously it's to support the artist and how to showcase their work. There's been an evaluative process around how to negotiate this white cube and what this- A little bit, but I think that the, let's say the tell here is that the habit, let's say, bled into my residential work. So this is a house that I finished in Tijuana for two young art collectors in about a year or two, year and a half after I finished the Matthew Marks Gallery. And consciously or not, and I think it was quite unconscious, I sort of stayed in that black and white modality. And you can see that the sort of uh, Kelly sculpture, which was black metal, has kind of drifted down to become a garage door. Yes. And now it's kind of white over black. And the only thing that lends color to this house, since it's it's black and white and gray concrete, is the garden. And I never noticed that until recently. Yeah. And when you say black over white, like you originally had referenced, can you expand on that a little more again? Well, Kelly, you know, when he was in Paris in the 50s, made a series of small studies in which he butted, you know, kind of black bars over white squares. And there was an exhibition at the Gagosian Gallery about the impact of, you know, the Russian artist Malevich uh, on 
American artists like Kelly and Donald Judd. And, and I mean, basically the minimalists, minimalists. Right. And Malievich, you know, famously made a black square in 1915, which was a pretty radical thing to do mm-hmm. uh, just to make a kind of negative space, um, you know, as a painting. So it was non-representational. According to the exhibition, this work had a significant impact on a number of artists working in America after uh, they were introduced to the work of, you know, the Russian suprematists at MoMA. And um, I I don't know what year the show at MoMA was, but, you know, the story is that basically this kind of radical act, you know, goes on to sort of reset the consciousness of certain mostly male American artists uh, working on the project of of zero content, right? Of removing content from from art, and it has something to do with with conceptualism as well. So that goes on to affect solo it, but I think that this kind of tendency bleeds into architecture, and you know, most famously, you can see it in the work of, of Richard Meyer, right? Who, you know, always kind of when asked why there was no color on his buildings, sort of said that white buildings take on the color of their environment. So they're never truly white. You know, if you put a white building next to a tree, it will, the tree will cast its greenness onto that white surface. Oh, interesting. Um, Yeah, but I don't buy that anymore. (laughs) I I, I used to really subscribe to that idea. And there is a... um, there's a tradition in, in Meyer's work, as in Guapney Siegel's work, as in, you know, other members of the New York Five who were kind of reworking Corbusier's interests of the 1920s. They were kind of working on that project in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s. There's the interesting kind of editing of Corb's own interest in color. And his later projects, including his own cabin in France, which was painted like acid yellow on the inside. But there's plenty of evidence in, in Corb's early work as well. Uh, in Pesach, he did some social housing. And I found recently in some archives, his color studies. And they're very beautiful and they're very pastely. And they're not what you associate with what Meyer took away, which was to not use color. And Corb also painted and was very influenced by Picasso. And so his paintings also, um, you know, suggest an interest in color. So it's it's really upon research further that to really see how Corbusier and Myers, their negotiations with color were when they entered into the color scheme, like you said, this rusty yellow, which uh-huh. in the chromophobia, there's specific fears of specific colors, which we don't have the time to go into today. Which sure. Would be interesting to get into why these colors elicit this. Yet, it's evident in what we're looking at. Going back to your work in the gallery space, I'm going to just move ahead to this next image. If you can tell us where there's now, we do see some colorful walls in the white cube space. Well, and so what's interesting is that the, the image on the left of Night Gallery, which is sort of a little bit east of downtown and, and south of the 10. Which, by the way, um, these are all like the hottest galleries in the city that I love. So it's just so cool to see that you you did this. But go on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I've always been, you know, very lucky with and fortunate to have, you know, great clients. Yeah. So, you know, the image on the left is uh, the gallery as it was designed. And, you know, my clients at Night Gallery, Davida and Mika, you know, did let me actually break out of the box. And so if I were to show you the plan, you'd be surprised that the walls are kind of all skewed. And we agreed that rather than having the, the as you know, the typical kind of front of house, back of house set up for a gallery, you know, reception desk at the front and the storage in the back, which you can't see and the gallery in the middle. We agreed to put all the pieces of the gallery in the middle of, of the warehouse. And so, you know, the gallery owners were happy that people could just wander through the storage space, which is really interesting. They, they allowed me to be transgressive enough to create an experience, let's say, for visitors to the gallery that would allow the kind of workings behind the scene of the gallery to become public, which I thought was pretty interesting. And they also agreed that 
the walls didn't have to be 90 degrees. So for me, that was like a big win. But, you know, it didn't even occur to me at that point to use color. So what you see on the right is an installation by the artist Carl Handel. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that it certainly transforms the space in, in some interesting ways. But what's important to note here is that the color is part of the art. So it's not, it's applied. There's a distinction here in these images between what the architect is sanctioned to do and what the artist is encouraged to do. And that's kind of why I started painting. And we can look at the next slide if you want, because it's also instructive. This is my friend, Yan Himen. She's a tremendous painter and sculptor from LA. And here, what she did very economically was to paint in the windows in the temporary installation at night gallery so that you can see during the day and, and, and at night, they take on a sort of different quality. Again, this is something that I've never even got into, which is to suggest, you know, a temporary use of color. Temporary and it to be just appearing from the window of the white cube. It's such right, a right. communication of this shift of this transition to color. And it is so different by day and by night. And so here you're, it's interesting to walk through these gallery spaces that you designed and mm -hmm. to then open up more and more to your own use of paint and color and your own painting. So it's, it's, it seems like an interesting parallel process as an architect and as a painter, as you're allowed to have more art, artistic expression or allowed to unleash and connect more with, with color. I took a shortcut, didn't I? If you go to the next slide, I mean, the gap between the uh, night gallery and my first exhibition as a painter was approximately four, almost five years, like half a decade, right? And I didn't pick up a brush until maybe 2016. The first pieces of art that I ever showed were abstractions of plans of buildings that I had made. And that was in a group show that was curated at For Your Art, which used to be on Wilshire across from LACMA. I think it was a pop-up space. Okay. And there was a show called Dialogue or Dialogues, Paris, Los Angeles. And it was like half architects and half uh, artists. And Francois Perrin, who uh, passed away recently, well, not so recently, a couple of years ago now, he curated the show. He's an architect, but he, he sort of bounced back and forth between the art and architecture world. And so what I showed then was a cast concrete model of the house in Tijuana and a series of photographs that I, of that same house that I printed onto purple and lilac colored paper. And I, uh, I think I marked the floor around the model with, you know, that sort of fluorescent pink paint that is used on streets, like on asphalt to like, mm -hmm. mark, you know, where, where to cut the ground open or whatever. Yeah. I think I masked that off and then I put the model in the middle of that. And then the next time I made art was I, I took plans from the Matthew Marks gallery and night gallery and a few other projects, and I abstracted them into kind of these woodblock lino cut prints, which referred to Malievich's black and white paintings. And then those were sold at an auction for the LA Forum for Architecture and Design. Are these the images that were these paintings? No, no, no. This, this, these are still black and white, and they, okay. they precede these images by a couple of years. And so let's say that was 2013 and 2014 or 15. This first painting here is the first piece of art that I've ever sold. It's four by four. The two images on the, actually, these are two paintings. The two images on the left or center and left are um, the painting that I sold uh, in 2017. Fantastic. And the painting on, thank you. And the painting on the right was its twin, which I gave to my mother. And so that was my first exhibition. And behind me is a painting from that first show. And it is of a vivisection of a horse in a kind of fluorescent orange over uh, a green and uh, 
blue and yellow study that I made from a photograph of my garden. It's well, I was going to say, you certainly have come into color, and yet when one goes into this painting, the one behind you, or the one that I'm viewing right yeah. now, it's dynamic. It's musical, it's architectural, it's it has a dead horse. It has a dead <laughs> horse. We could we could analyze that more. What dream was that yeah. about, Zellner? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I, I think the horse is me. I, I'm realizing that cutting open the horse and discovering the horse is made of colored yarn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe sort of weird, but um, yeah, I don't know why. I'm gig- I don't know why I'm giggling so manically, but but uh, there might be something there. I think there's a lot there, and I wish we had more time to go into it because you know I have a fascination with you know as we've talked about the architect's dream world and how much of that you are connected to, and to see this in your artwork going from the architectural space to your paintings is really just amazing. It's an awesome experience to have. And I, as a psychotech psychotherapist, to see you like just flourish in this way, it's really wonderful. If you look at the next two slides, the last two, I mean, what's interesting is this was the second show in 2019 in which I did two sort of strange things that I haven't quite figured out. One is I started to make more work serially and more quickly on paper. The second is that I started painting on the ground. And Charlie James, who's a gallerist here in Los Angeles, he you may know, did a studio visit. And I showed him all my work and I kind of laid it out in my garden where I, I tend to paint in the garden. Well, not tend to. I mean, I don't have a studio, so I tend to paint outside. <laughs> so uh, he said, hey, why don't you just show the work? the way you showed it to me here on, uh, you know, I used to live in a place in Mar Vista that had these kind of like concrete paths, uh, just two strips, like from an old garage. And so I took him up on his suggestion since it seemed pretty brilliant. And I ended up building a platform in a gallery on Jefferson for this two person show I did with Tyler McMartin, who's an, another architect who happens to be a painter, but he actually trained, uh, he has a BFA from, uh, you know, skid more in painting, but um, I'm untrained. But anyway, th- the point is, you know, I, I did something strange here that I still need to think about, which is that I architecturalized the painting. I made them part of a, a floor structure. And then I, I used that floor structure to connect a column, which you can see a detail up here with the corner of the warehouse. So there's something going on there, but we'll Right, see. but that's interesting how the painting is now moving into architectural form. Mm, at, slowly. So <laughs> slowly. It's yeah, really, slowly. It's, it's a stunning, it's a stunning when you have that view to aerially look at how it like jets out like a ladder, but it's a floor mosaic space. It's really starting yeah. to move into yeah. that realm. And as our last question and, and what we're going to talk about with, with chromophobia right we were relating it to, in the beginning, just to bookend it, trying to control nature, the fear of color, the suppression of it, um, Mm -hmm. and all that that means. When I broached that topic with you and how we look at color and housing and how sometimes it's against the law, which that was a new understanding for me, but your own lineage that you've been connecting to more Martinez, um, Mm -hmm. your Latin roots, and yeah. so this is evident in your your mother's lineage. Your mom is Martinez. Is that right? Your yeah, dad that was, was her Zellner. Yeah. Zellner. Okay. And as we see these vibrant, colorful, stunning, what is this town? Well, there are two towns. And so that's what's interesting. I mean, one is in Nicaragua on, on the left. And so that's Granada. And Granada. um yeah, and I have family from uh, Managua, Granada, De Tienda, and Leon. And so in the colonial cities in Nicaragua, you see, like in most of Latin America, a very liberal and chaotic and very happy, well, you can say it's happy if you want or not, that's a judgment, uh, maybe just normal use of color. 
And the image on the right, which is interesting, is Romania, where my father grew up. Oh, that's and right. And that's a, a medieval city on the Morris River called the Chimishwara. I may be mangling the pronunciation. I don't speak Romanian. So both my parents were immigrants. Both my parents were artists. My mother was a, a classically trained singer, and so she, she sang with the New York City Opera. And my dad was an exhibition designer, but also a painter and a sculptor. And he worked primarily um, at LACMA and he, before that at the Metropolitan. So I've always been around art. But what I didn't realize is that really, if I look at, you know, their places of origin, it's clear that color in very different palettes, right? So, I mean, I think that, you know, the two images, you know, one has a sort of bright, I think, uh, you know, neon quality and equally beautiful, I think, is is the ways in which, you know, in Eastern Europe, sort of Easter egg sort of colors are applied yeah. to buildings. But That's but right. clearly we don't see this very much anywhere in North America, maybe with the exception of Miami and parts of, you know, East Los Angeles, uh, you know, in which, you know, Latino communities or Latinx communities um that, that know, we see more to, now emerging in yeah, um, yeah, our murals yeah. and it's it's wanting to be expressed more and more in our in Los Angeles. But remember to get the murals in place, the city had to pass a mural ordinance, right? To legalize the use of color on your building. Because prior to that, <sighs> you could be cited for Again. having an artist. Yeah, it's amazing. Again, I mean cited for yeah. color. Well, not only that, cited for having an illegal mural, yes. you know, which is fascinating, you know, in so much of the rest of the world, like if you go to Valparaiso in, in Chile, which is also, it was a city that has an amazing kind of mural art. Um, it's just applied. I mean, it's, <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to get a permit. Um, and what the mural, what the mural ordinance did, which is amazing, and it was pioneered in the planning department by a planner by the name of Tanner Blackman and others who assisted with the with the ordinance, is it said to building owners, if you put this up, it's not graffiti. In, in other words, it's not criminal. It's legal to have an artist come and decorate your building or paint on your building. And um you don't even have to ask now for permission to do it in some cases, especially in the arts district, which is great. Which is great. And that's progress. But I think just to conclude, I mean, it's an uphill battle, I think sometimes personally, but also I think, you know, back to from the personal to the political, but also politically to use color and pattern. And pattern. And I think that is a great way to end because as we talk about the personal as political and to see your evolution as an architect and artist and how you are always merging those two worlds as a critic, as a creator, as a writer, I never quite expected this interview to go into the realm of, yes, why is color illegal and how murals are now... <laughs> you know, transcending this and to have an opportunity to talk to you and to be able to, you know, witness your work and to hopefully get to follow these future projects as you now being builder and designing your own home. I really hope that we can continue this conversation because it truly is an honor and a gift. And I want to be back in your classroom. I okay. want to talk art history, history of architecture and understanding how our legal system works. I mean, you are such a you are such a reference and guide into this this world of architecture, art and psychology and I am just really honored that you gave me this time to explore and learn more about your work. So I hope we can continue this further. To be continued, Rachel. And thank you for the opportunity. The honor is mine. I really, um, yeah, I, I enjoy the uh, forum and I'm looking forward to seeing your other episodes.
And we'll be giving our guests and listeners your contact information. Um, I'm oh. sure they'll be interested in how they can contact you to see how, you know, as a potential client. So thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see you, to talk to you. And I feel so inspired to get more into color <laughs> and architecture. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, thank and- you for having me. You're welcome. Okay, take care, and we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. This is Psychotecture by Rachel Malvald with coaching, consultation, and psychotherapy offered virtually and in-home throughout the Los Angeles greater area and nationally. We work to ease design challenges to create transformative habitats. Thank you, and we look forward to the next episode and your questions. If you're enjoying this Psychotech is in, please subscribe to my podcast, as well as follow me on social media at Rachel Malvald. And if you are a client, couple, or designer architect having a design challenge, please feel free to email me at my website, psychotecture.com, or rachel at psychotecture.com.